today we're going to continue our awakening series with week two. This topic I want to talk about tonight, today, excuse me, is called The Struggle is Real. Anybody met with some adversity in your life ever? Yeah? Anybody just drive to church this morning and met with some adversity? You know, sometimes, I mean, you could get up every other day of the week, but on Sundays, for some reason, your kids just drag a little slower. There is more intense moments of fellowship between you and your spouse. In fact, I would submit that some of you, on the way to church, were not very kind to one another. Sharing one another with much love. In fact, there was probably some argument, some frustration, maybe even some ignoring but when you got into the church doors, is bless God, hallelujah, God is on the throne, the devil is a liar. Oh, things are going good in my life. I hate my wife right now, but things are going good. Have you ever faced a little bit of adversity in your life? I think it's good that we serve a God that understands the struggle and knows that the struggle is real. And still shows up in our life regardless of what we're going through. And so in an awakening, what we need is we need to understand that an awakening doesn't mean that there is a stop of the struggle but actually when God moves the enemy tries to bring distraction to the move every time it means that if God turns up the faucet you better bet your boots that the enemy's coming after you and I would submit to you this morning that if you're not being attacked it's probably because you're not being used right now so we shouldn't look at it as an attack as something to run from but as something to Look at with, okay, what is God doing and about to do in my life? So I want to invite you to continue to join us in our awakening journey of prayer and fasting for 21 days. If you didn't get a book last week, we have a digital copy that, that, we, can, uh, that we can get to you. Or they're on the information booth out in the lobby. You can pick those up. And there's a card in it called an awakening prayer card. Now, has everybody gotten a card or anybody need more cards? Let me explain the awakening prayer card before we jump into the word of God this morning. We're believing that we're not fasting in vain. That God is going to answer our prayers powerfully. That we're putting things on these cards that are, that are incredible asks of the Lord. And so if you have a card and you wrote one thing down, get another card. If you got a card and God answered it in a week... Praise God, hallelujah, get another card. If God answered your prayer in a week, it just means your prayer wasn't big enough and you hadn't been asking enough for it. <laughs> He's like, okay, what else do you got for me? And God invites us to persistently annoy him with requests. He invites us to continue to seek after him and ask and ask and ask and ask. So we're going to get these prayer cards, we're going to date them the day that you receive it, the day that you pray it, and we're believing on January 26th at our prayer rally that these altars will be full of answered prayer cards. Now the only way that the altars will be full of answered prayer cards if we're all here together praying on January 26th at 6 p.m. And I know you're saying, but pastor, that is a night service. We just had the installation service, that was another night service, you're asking a lot. And I would say to you, yeah. <laughs> If you're okay with the status quo, continue to do what you've been doing. But if you want to be part of what God is doing now, we better do a little bit more. And so I'm inviting you to be a part of what God is doing now, January 26th at 6 p.m. on a night of miracles at a prayer rally where we punch holes in heaven until heaven falls down. And we believe that it's going to happen. And it already has. Okay, that is the commercial I have for you today. We're going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 9, and we're going to start in verse 10. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and jump in it. If you don't, grab that purple Bible in front of you or maroon. Except when I grow up in Texas, we don't like the A&M Aggies, so we don't say maroon. We'll call it purple, okay? Uh, a lot of my trouble in life revolves around sports teams, so uh, I'm working on that. Me and the Lord are working. That's my 21-day prayer card, actually, is that he would deliver me from some of those things. Uh, uh, go ahead and jump to the book of Luke. We're going to talk around the idea of the struggle is real. And this is how it starts. It's the feeding of the 5,000, maybe a familiar story to some. Maybe your first time in church, you've never heard it before, but I ask that you would listen with new ears today and a fresh perspective. It says, and the apostles, when they had returned, told him, him being Jesus, all that they had done. 
that he took them and went out. Excuse me, let me stop. Can we stand for the honoring and the reading of God's word? Somebody like started to stand up. I was like, what? Are, oh, yeah, we stand for the reading of God's word. <laughs> See, some of us are getting used to these new habits here. Luke 9. And the apostles, when they had returned, told Jesus all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to a city called Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him. He received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And he healed those who had the need of healing. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place. But Jesus said to them, You feed them. You give them something to eat. And they said to Jesus, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all these people. For where, uh, uh, so, sorry, for there were about 5,000 men at this place. Then he said to the disciples, Make them sit down into groups of 50. They did so and made them all sit down. And then he took the loaves. And he took the fish, and looking into heaven, he blessed them, he broke them, and he gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and twelve baskets of leftover fragments were taken up by them. Father, please confirm your word today. Speak to us new and afresh. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On your way down, tell somebody the struggle is real. I love this story of the feeding of the 5,000. Now, something interesting about this story is that it was actually an important story in the ministry and the life of Jesus. It was so important that it's one of the only miracles that, re that shows up in all four of the Gospels. If you look in the book of Matthew, boom, feeding of the 5,000. You look in the book of Mark, boom, it's there too. Luke, obviously, and even, yes, the obscure book of John has the feeding of the 5,000. Now, if it's in all four books, that's called a repeated theme when reading the Scriptures. If you notice a repeated theme, it's like God taking a megaphone saying, hey, I've got something for you to look at right here. Now, I don't know about you, but if God's taking a megaphone and yelling at me, I better listen. But sometimes, when God takes a megaphone and yells at me, I listen long enough to get him to actually hit me in the head with the megaphone so that I can get paying attention. Can anybody relate to that? So the feeding of the 5,000, if you take and read all of the scriptures in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of the feeding of the 5,000, I think it's a, an average of about six to seven verses in each book. So it's not a lot of reading. You get a full picture of what's actually going on in this story. So let's look at the setting and the background and let's pull out some points that I believe God wants to speak to us today about our struggle and about the awakening that he's bringing to Northwest Ohio. The first thing we have to understand is that the text here says that when they all had returned, what does that mean? They all had returned. Maybe they had run to Kroger and picked up the five loaves and two fish. Probably not because when we read that somewhere else we understand that they actually stole that from a little boy. <laughs> which you know if you were uh, looking at that you say sometimes to do God's work you got to steal candy from babies no no you don't say that <clears throat> somebody wrote that down that's good I'm gonna, I'm gonna at Halloween I'm gonna remember that um, no he says this he says that when they all returned they told Jesus all they had done and Jesus looked at them and noticed something different about them See, previously, Jesus had sent his 12 disciples out. They had watched him do some incredible things, and, and they were like that, uh, that associate pastor that's ready to go out. Look, I, I've heard all your stories. Man, I, I've seen you take the offering. I, I'm ready to go out. Jesus says, you go out, you're going to preach the gospel, and you're going to heal people everywhere that you go. In fact, don't even take anything with you. Just take a backpack, the shoes on your feet, the clothes that you're wearing, and you guys go out and do this thing. And they're like, yeah! He says, and if you come to anybody that doesn't receive you, you walk out of the door, you kick the dust off their feet of your shoes, and you keep going. They're like, we can be mean to people. 
There's some disciples that leaned into that a little bit too much. They're like, I'm not getting any love in this place. I'm just going to kick some dust. And the other guys are eating some soup like, hey, hey, dude, Thomas. Thomas, stop doubting what's going on in this house, okay? Come back into the fold. And so they had done all of this stuff, and, and they, had, they had gone from town to town. And it was a lot of work. It was a season where they were required to bring a lot of faith and a lot of themselves to the table. So they come back to Jesus, worn out and tired. Now on their way back, news had begun to circulate. The, the church gossip train had gotten going a little bit. And one of their, man, one of their heroes, one of their allies, one of the greatest voices in the, in the Israel at this time, they had, they had heard the news that, that their beloved John the Baptist had been beheaded by Herod. Imagine doing all of this work for the Lord and then all of a sudden you get some news that just takes it out of you. You're already worn out and exhausted from giving yourself to people who are maybe feeding you some bread, but most of the time probably rejecting the message that you're bringing. And on your way back, you get news that even gets you further worn out. Jesus had also received this news. They all get back together, and it's not like a high-five series of events. They tell Jesus what they had done. I'm sure Jesus was proud of them. But the feeling in the room that I get from reading this is more of heaviness than it is of energy. It's more of, Jesus, look, we did a lot of cool things, but you don't know what we've been through, and we're really going through a lot right now. We're worn out. We need some rest. Jesus, being so good to him, says, Hey, let's go to a deserted place. Let's go right now. We'll get into the boat. We'll go across the Sea of Galilee here, which is not a, a, a long journey. And we're going to go to the desert that's right outside of Bethsaida. It's, it's going to be a great area where we can kind of refuel ourselves and just spend some time as a family. And the disciples were like, yes. Thank you, God. We get a vacation. Anybody live for vacation? <laughs> We get a vacation. They get into the boat, and this, this probably a junior high boy over here, or probably a junior high girl, both of them can't keep their mouth shut. So they overhear what's going on, and what do they start doing? Man, they start telling everybody, Jesus is going over there. Hey, Jesus is going to be over there. Jesus is going to go over there. It says that the multitude, a crowd gathered, a lot of people, about 5,000 men, were so stoked about what Jesus was going to do, and where Jesus was going to be, that they actually ran as fast as they could around the lake. Jesus is going through the lake. They run around the lake and beat Jesus to the place. I don't know about you, but that's a slow boat. Because to cross the Sea of Galilee is 7 to 11 miles, but to go from where they were at to where they needed to be was about 20 miles. And this crowd, can you imagine the Columbus Marathon beating you in a car from Columbus to Detroit? No, but these people were motivated. Which just goes to show that Jesus can motivate people who don't normally run to run a lot. Now, I have not yet ran because I believe Proverbs says, he who runs without somebody chasing him is a fool. <laughs> that was my resolution. I do not want to be foolish anymore this year, Jesus. <laughs> Could you imagine, though, being in the boat expecting a vacation, and when you get there, it's another ministry assignment. Could you imagine? Well, I've just gotten done with the season that was difficult in my life, and I'm expecting that God is going to allow me to rest on the sidelines for just a moment to catch my breath, and yet he taps me on the shoulder and says, look, there's more people that need you. And the disciples are like, Jesus, we've just been out. And, and more than that, like if, if that was all it was, we could do it. We could, we could give more of ourselves. But we've got to talk about our friend, John the Baptist. We've got, we got to mourn together a little bit. Jesus, don't you understand the season that we're in? But it says that when Jesus got to the other side of the water, and he saw the crowd there, that he looked upon them with compassion. And that his compassion moved him more than his tiredness. And he knew that he had to do something for these people. So they, he, he starts teaching them. And, and, 
And it's on a hill, and it's kind of an amphitheater. It's perfect for it. It's like Jesus knew what was going to happen before it happened. Because where he took the disciples was a deserted place, but it was the perfect place to have about 5,000 men hear a message of hope and healing for about 18 hours. Now, aren't you glad that I'm only going to speak for about four hours today? That's perspective. If I'm going to be like Christ, i got to speak till you're hungry, passing out, and then feed you a little bit and speak a little bit longer. We're not going to do that, though. Jesus begins to minister to the people, and uh, the sun begins to, to, to go down. And, and I don't know if you know the phrase hangry, but if you've got about 5,000 men, it means they brought all their kids and, and their wife. And, and, you know, I grew up learning how to count as a Pentecostal, so you multiply everything by three for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So 5,000 quickly becomes 15,000 relatively fast. But historically, they believe that there was 10 to 15,000 people actually at this site, that it wasn't just 5,000 of mankind's agents coming together, but it was actually about 10 to 15,000 people. And Jesus is like talking a long time. And they're saying, look, Bob Evans' lunch menu is going on right now. And if you don't be quiet, Jesus, we're going to miss the lunch special and have to pay dinner prices. Now, I don't know if you know these people, but they are not about dinner prices. So you better let them go. And Jesus is like, okay, they're hungry and they're tired. Kind of like you, you feed them. Well, that's fair, isn't it? If I could count how many times I said that's not fair to God, it would be a lot. And if I had a dollar for every time, my tithe would be incredible. But Jesus said, no, you feed them. You see that need? Do something about it. It says that one of the disciples, it says all of the disciples and apostles in Luke, but in one of the areas it talks about Philip coming up and saying, we don't have much, God. We found a boy that has five loaves of bread and two fish. We don't have anything because you asked us to go out and give everything. And when we got back to you, you didn't even give us time to refuel, but you promised that we were going to go somewhere to refuel. And now you're telling me on empty to feed these people? So what I have to do is I have to go to Long John Silver's and find a person that's got five loaves and two fish. That's all we got, Jesus. And even if we fed everybody here, they say, it would take eight months' salary to feed everybody. Come on, who wants to give eight months' salary right now this morning? We'll take it. Just come to the altar and throw it down. We don't want that in a check, though. We want that in gold bars, okay? Could you imagine being asked to look at, a, look at a situation and the demand of the situation feels overwhelming. It feels like there's not enough. It feels like the struggle has just hit you right in the face. And I would submit to you today that there are people in this room that are living life this way. You're spiritually running on empty. You've been in a season that it felt like God was asking you to stretch in ways that demanded your time, talent, and treasure, and it's made you uncomfortable. You need a time where you can refresh and refuel, and God promised you that he would bring rest. And yet, here he comes, a season where he wants you to push in a little bit more. There's people that need a little bit more compassion, and you're feeling like you're running on empty and can't give them anything. This is the fate of the disciples in this moment. A little boy's lunch, five loaves and two fish. Could you imagine them bringing this to Jesus? Like, I'm sure that there was one disciple that was probably a little insecure about bringing this to Jesus. Like, hey, this is all we have. But I'm sure that there was a disciple like me that would have been like, hey, Jesus, guess what? That's all we got. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm not going to be insecure and have, like, a sheepish attitude. I'm going to front him up a little bit and tell him, you asked us to feed these people, you didn't give us anything to do it with. You deal with it. You told us to feed them? No, you feed them. And you're looking at me all judgmental like you don't talk to Jesus that way, but I know what you do in the deep recesses of your mind. I know that we're not any different, that I struggle with Jesus just like you struggle with Jesus. 
that when he asks me to do things that I don't understand, I'm going to debate with him rather than walk out in faith. I get to a place of faith after a lot of conversation. Can anybody relate to that? I love it in this story, though, that Jesus never corrects the disciples. He's always got enough bandwidth for their frustration. He understands the reality of their struggle, and yet his compassion moves him not to correct them, but to challenge their perspective to change from what's in front of them as five loaves and two fish to who's in front of them instead. And Jesus says, hey, okay, give me what you got. He took the bread, he took the fish, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to him, and he said, go feed them now. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a town, uh, in, a, in a family of four kids. And if we got pizza, for some reason my mom could never understand how to order enough pizza to feed my little brother and the rest of us. <laughs> I don't know what it was. He'll watch this later and he'll agree with it. That as soon as the pizza walked into the door, well, the pizza didn't walk, but somebody brought it in. As soon as the pizza made it into the house, my little brother Jeffrey would run down with a plate that he had hidden in his room for I don't know how long, throw the pizza open, and just take a full large to himself without regard for anybody else. Now, I don't know if you've been to a men's breakfast, but when there's a buffet at a men's breakfast, the person through the line first always eats best. Yep, they're going to eat about 12 eggs that day, 14 links of sausage, and as many pancakes as their heart could contend with. I'm at two fish, five loaves, 10,000 people, and Jesus says, go pass it out. And all the youngest people in that area were going, I'm not going to get anything. All the oldest people in that area were saying, I'm going to decline mine for somebody else. And all the middle people were like, the youngest is going to get everything. That's how these people would think, just like you and I. And the disciples break them up, and they begin to pass out the food. Now, I want you to note here that the disciples or Jesus never made an announcement to the crowd about how much food they have. Oftentimes, we think that the miracle was for the crowd. But if you look at the text, it never says that they told the crowd that they only had five loaves and two fish. The only people that knew that they had five loaves and two fish were Jesus, the apostles, and a little boy. The crowd just knew that they were getting broken up into groups of 50, that they had eaten a lot of uh, good spiritual food that day, and that they had been healed. They knew that they were a little bit hungry and that they were on the verge of being hangry, that they weren't going to start, they were going to stop listening. So the crowd didn't know what miracle was happening, but the disciples knew what miracle was happening. Because they begin to pass out five loaves and two fish, and they never run out. In fact, it says that everybody got to eat until their heart was content. They got to get full. It wasn't that they got to eat a piece. It wasn't that they got to eat a little bit. They got to get full. I'm talking about Thanksgiving stretchy pants full. And then Jesus said, pick up the leftovers. Ooh. The disciples were like leftovers, so they go and get the baskets that Jesus had sent them out with, with nothing. That's all that they had to carry was the basket on their back. It's like Jesus predetermined the miracle when he sent them out. You don't know what's going to happen, but you're going to give yourself out to empty. You're going to feel like there's nothing left to give, that there's a struggle in front of you. But the means to receive the miracle has been on your back the entire time. So they have a basket, and they start collecting them up. We can clap. It's happy. So they start collecting them up, each one to their own group, and they fill up their baskets. In fact, they fill up so many baskets that everybody has their own basket. There's 12 of them. There's 12 baskets. Judas even got a basket. If I'm Jesus, I'm going to get Judas half a basket. No, he got a full basket. It says that there were so much left over that there were 12 baskets left. It's an incredible story. But there's a lot of lessons to be learned from it, isn't there? I think one of the hardest lessons we can learn is to overcome tiredness. 
that God promises a Sabbath. He promises rest in his presence. Yes. But even Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Sometimes in God's kingdom, rest comes in seasons and not days. I want to encourage you this morning that if you're in a time where you felt like you've given everything to God that you possibly could give, everything that he's asked for you to give, and maybe you're a little disappointed with the outcome and you're a little tired, you're a little worn out, you're a little weary, to latch onto the phrase that weariness makes cowards of us all. It's in our tiredness where we make the mistake of sitting on the bench and stop getting in the game with God, where we become sleepy and dormant in what God's doing. God is not needing an awakening. We are needing an awakening. God has always been on the move. The first lesson that we learn in the struggle is that if we allow tiredness to distract our focus, we could miss out on the miracle. See, the enemy doesn't want to destroy you. He wants to distract you. Because if he can distract you, you'll destroy yourself. Now his motive is to still kill and destroy. The outcome of his motive is that you will be destroyed, but the means by which you're destroyed is in our own distraction. Note that when Adam and Eve were tempted in the Garden of Eden, the enemy didn't pin Eve down and force her to eat the apple. He just made the apple look more appealing than it had before. He distracted Eve with a more enticing apple. I, I think it's an apple. It could be a pomegranate. Don't let tiredness distract your focus from what Jesus is about to do. Think of the disciples as they're passing out the food. Thomas, do you have more? A little. I doubt it's going to go anywhere. <laughs> Philip, where are you at? I got still some more, but man, I got two groups of 50 left, but it, it hasn't run out yet. Peter, where are you at? I cut two ears off, but they're good. <laughs> they're good. Could you, could you just... Hear them in this place yelling at each other. I still got, I still got bread. The crowd's like, why are, they, why are they yelling at each other? Of course they still got bread. The crowd has no clue what's going on. The disciples are, are panting. They're like, okay, this is awesome. I'm sure that they were tired when it started. But I bet as it got going, they got energized. Because when you are tired and God starts to move in the miraculous... All of a sudden, you forget about how tired you were. You only remember how tired you were if you stop getting in God's plan. When we take ourselves out of the game, we realize how tired we are. It's like when, when I'm playing with the kids, I only realize how tired I am later that night. I only realize how my body does not work the way it once did later that night it's only when I stop being active with them that the pain sets in imagine think about this in the kingdom of God that even in our tiredness God's grace is sufficient and his mercy is new every morning that we can face our struggles knowing that God is for us and not against us that there is a miracle that he wants to do through us and that should give us the energy and the vitality to continue to push forward regardless of the season that we came out of Regardless of the news that we got, man, when well, we're on God's team, our tiredness is taken care of by the miraculous. We move from an attitude of someone should do that to I'm all in. What did they say to Jesus? You feed them. You send them away. What did Jesus say to him, to them? <laughs> you feed them. Oh, I know what I can do. You feed them. Let's go on your faith and your energy. I would, I would uh, ask you, Dayspring, that if you've gotten out of the game of doing church, if you've gotten tired because of transition, you've gotten tired because of, of whatever has happened in your, in your life or in this church, you've, you've grown a, a little bit skeptical. You, you just want to see what it's going to be about. Don't get so caught up in trying to see what it's going to be about that you miss getting to be a part of it. Move from somebody should really do that to, man, I am all in. Because when we are all in on God's team, our tiredness is taken care of. I love this point. I love it because I wrote it. Actually, I, I believe the Holy Spirit wrote it, but it is really intelligent. 
what seems like a little in our eyes is always more than enough in the hands of God. This is Jesus. In Colossians it says that all things were made by Him and through Him all things are sustained. This is Jesus. It means that this is the Creator. This is the one that, that formed and fashioned things. This is the one that took something from nothing and made it something. Nothing from something and made it something. That's more better. That's bad grammar too. <laughs> Pastor Jeremy will correct me later because he's the teacher. This is Jesus. He could have, he could have sat there and said, oh, they're hungry? Are they hungry? Okay, well, guess what? I've done this before. I'll do it again. Manna from heaven. Everybody, please pick up the grass around you and eat it. It's now a ribeye steak. You know what I mean? Like, this is Jesus. He could have done it. He could have snapped his finger and made them full. It's Jesus. But what does Jesus do? He doesn't create something from nothing, but he does take what they bring him and multiply it so that it's enough. You say, look, I came and I don't have enough to give. There's too big of a need. There, there's too much going on in our community. We'll never make an impact in the foster system. We'll never make an impact with human trafficking. There's just too big of a need. I'm telling you that the need is in the room today, or, or the answer to the need is in the room today. It's sitting in that pew right where you're sitting. And when you bring your little to Jesus, it's met with His grace and abundance. There's so much more that Jesus can do with what you bring to Him we got to stop asking Jesus to create something out of nothing. Faith is bringing something to Jesus and trusting that He's going to do what He said He'll do because He is who He says that He is. We just take God at His word. I love the faith of the little boy because he was like, boom, I got some food. Why do I got food? Because this is Jesus we're talking about. Y'all are crying, and you're tired, and you're weak, and you call, he calls you his disciples. He should have chose me. I came prepared to watch him do something. I didn't know what, but I brought this, and I brought that. I'm ready. Oh, there's a need. I might not get this back. I, it might not double down the way that I think it should. I don't care because it's Jesus, and I'm going to trust him to do more with my little than I can even do with my little. The boy is awesome. He's the hero of the story. Or is it the disciple that said, okay, we'll take your lunch. We're grown-ups, and you're a boy, but we'll take your lunch from you. You don't need it. You're not growing and strong. We're hungrier than you. We're stronger than you. We'll take your lunch. You know what I mean? Like, I, I always want to, that's one of the things in heaven I want to play back. What was that conversation like? The young boy said, man, I can't feed everyone, but I can feed somebody. There's a guy named Delmer Ross. Delmer uh, started with Dave Wilkerson, the Team Challenge movement. And Delmer was my pastor's father and, and really a grandfather to me. Delmer lived his life giving what he could away. In fact, when we were growing up at the end of church on a Sunday night, we would, we'd go to a, a pizza place called Pinocchio's with an arcade. I knew I never had to bring money because Delmer always carried quarters. So I knew I could get his quarter, I could change that with my brother, and I could get his quarter because I was bigger, and I, I knew that I could get more money because Delmer would start me off. Pastor Delmer died a couple of years ago. And when he died, uh, his family was around him, and they were mourning and, and crying. And I mean, it was it was a cool moment, though. As, as he was going into heaven, he he looked up and he said, "I see Jesus. I see Jesus." He was speaking in tongues the whole way out. His family is left there crying, kind of put all the pieces together, and somebody calls one of the siblings, and I have permission to share the story. And they said, "I just had the." A vision of your father in heaven not not your heavenly father but your dad Delmer in heaven and when he went in oh he had so much peace and so much joy and, and there was a bunch of Native Americans dancing with him it was the strangest thing and they got off the phone and she shared this with her siblings and they all started to weep because when their dad started in ministry 
There was a missionary from Oklahoma that wanted to reach out to the Native Americans that came and visited his church, and he committed there to $100 a month. From that moment to the month of his death, he was faithful to give what he could. And because of him, a whole reservation has been saved. Not because of him, because of Jesus, but because of what he could do. What seems like a little, $100 a month. Maybe that's a lot to you. Maybe it's a little to you. $100 a month was eternity to somebody who heard the gospel. Never discredit what God can do through what you can bring. If you feel like this morning that you've been isolated, that you've been marginalized, that you don't have enough, you've got to know that we serve a God that is more than enough. We serve a God that wants to take you right where you are and move you to a place of abundance. That what you can bring, your little, can be multiplied to much in the hands of God. This third lesson and the final one we read. We're pushing up to lunch, so I know that I'm about to have to do a lunch on Silver's Run myself. When we spend our lives for Jesus, not only can he do a lot with our little, but there's always abundance. But here's the lesson. Abundance is birthed in the act of obedience, always. Abundance is never birthed out of hoping for it. It's always birthed in obedience. First, obedience of the disciples. Next, the obedience of the boys. Next, the obedience of the disciples. Then the prayer of Jesus and the obedience of the disciples. And then the obedience again. There are seven steps of obedience that the disciples have to take before they collect their portion of the miracle. And seven of those steps require them giving to somebody else. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? But there's always abundance with Jesus. It moves us from, we have to do this. We have to feed these people because Jesus is here till we get to be part of something. I'm praying that in 2020, our perspective shifts if it hasn't already from, oh, we have to do this till we get to be a part of it. That we're gonna be a church that gets to be a part of things. That we get to be a part of the change that's happening in our community. That we get to be part of a revival that's coming in Northwest Ohio. That we get to be a part of some incredible things. That we get to see some things happen. That we get to do the work of ministry. That we get to get involved. We get to do this. People say, where do you go? You say, man, we are on fire and we get to do a lot. And our God is a God of abundance. After this moment, after the feeding of the 5,000, guess what happens to the disciples? They get back to work. Maybe it wasn't rest that they needed after all the way that they thought. Maybe they just needed to remember that busyness doesn't count for ministry, but presence does. That doing a lot doesn't count but doing a lot in the presence of God counts a lot. So I want to encourage you this morning that God's got some things for us to be a part of. That we're going to be a church that ushers in an awakening. That we're going to bring joy to our community, but verse is going to flow through us. But I would tell you that if you feel like you've got lack, that you don't have enough to bring, bring it anyway. If you feel like you've been tired because of the season that you just come out of, you have to understand that in your tiredness, the enemy tries to distract you, but it's also the birthplace of the obedience for your miracle. So if you're tired today, we want to pray for you. We want to pray that your spirit would be rejuvenated, that your spirit would be revigorated, that you would, that you would hear God's voice once again, that that which you thought was stolen is actually being returned. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and by golly, running over. 